happy Father's Day to all the fathers. And if we would, let's uh, stand and sing Footsteps of Jesus.
In way of announcements, uh, remember our services tonight, uh, 6 o'clock, 5.30 prayer room. Uh, remember that there will be finger foods after the services tonight. Uh, remember our sick. Uh, remember our church. And this morning's speaker is going to be Brother Clint Carter. And Miss Lucille's got something that she wants to say. And after she gets done, Brother Clint, it's... Good morning. Happy Father's Day to each and every one of you. A good father is one of the most unsung, unpraised, unnoticed, and yet one of the most valuable assets in our society. And one of the greatest people in the world said that, and that was Billy Graham. Fathers are very important in our life. I've always felt like in my heart that fathers didn't get the honor and the praise that they deserved. Because to me, my dad was wonderful. He was, we came from a poor family. We worked hard, but there was one thing about it. My dad always loved us. And he showed that love. He would get out and run and play with us. You'd think he was a teenager, the way he'd take on and do but he just enjoyed them, and he loved his kids. A father sometimes doesn't know how to express his emotions. However, they love us unconditionally. From playing with us to teaching us, they dedicate all their time and effort to us. They guide us in every aspect of our life. They put their family first, especially if they're a Christian. Family is the most important thing to them. They teach us how to become better people. They guide us with their strength and they listen with love. And if you can't listen to your children, you'll never teach them love. They've got to be shown. And always remember, a child looks to ye to lead them, to guide them, direct them in their paths. They expect their hero and that's what dads are thought of, their hero, to be there for them. And you know, my dad's been gone since 1989, but I miss him even today. He would call me every day, if nothing else but to say, hello, how you doing today? What you going to do this day? So 
if you've got a dad, please let him know you love him. I wouldn't want my dad back in the shape he left in because he was so sick. But I'd love to see him, and I'd love to see my mom. And one day, I will. And I'm looking forward to that day. And to my husband, happy Father's Day to each and every one of you. That's one thing about Jimmy. He loves his kids. They're the most important thing in his life. And I'm so thankful for that and so grateful. And Teresa and Linda, would y'all hand out these covers to the dads? If your dad, please stand up. It's not much, but it's just to say we love you and that you mean everything to us. They're uh, finishing handing out these cups. And I want to tell you, first of all, to all the fathers, happy Father's Day this morning. And uh, please pray for me this morning as I have thought I was over. Uh, been fighting this sinus stuff for the past week. And uh, my wife... Uh, and my son are not here this morning. Uh, I want to apologize for that. They usually go with me. Uh, my son woke up this morning sometime, I don't even know, uh, and wasn't feeling too well, so I don't know if it's carrying on through the house or what. But uh, I do want to tell you this morning, it's a privilege to be here. Uh, Any time that we get the honor to stand behind God's pulpit, and I consider that what it is this morning, God's pulpit, amen? And if anybody stands behind it and doesn't preach the word of God, then they do not deserve the right to do that. But I think this morning that it is an honor to stand behind the pulpit and preach God's word. I told uh, Brother Steve this morning as I entered in their Sunday school class that uh, maybe I shouldn't have been there, but... Uh, but then again, after we got the lesson going and understanding what the message was about and understanding that, I, I felt like Paul in the scripture and, uh, and felt like the, the chief of all sinners this morning. And, and Paul said that in the scripture this morning. He said he was the chief of all sinners. And, and some of you will understand in just a few moments when I give you the title of the message this morning. But as I'm speaking this morning, if you want to turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 3, Daniel chapter 3 this morning, and we will be preaching a message on, are you a compromising Christian? Are you a compromising Christian? Now, I don't know if any of the rest of y'all did the same Sunday school lesson or what, but in this morning's lesson in Sunday school, it talked about compromising our faith and compromising ourselves, And I love when I'm able to go to a church, especially as this. Now, I've pastored several churches in the area. Uh, I was a pastor at Hesbeth Baptist Church out in Dixie Union for a little over two years. I was also a pastor of a church in Waycross called Ware Terrace Baptist uh, for, my, for probably around four years. And then my last church was in a little town of uh, Hoboken or Slaughterville. Uh, now, I don't know why they named that place Slaughterville. I'm not even going to entertain you why. But, uh, but it was a little church called Oak Hill Baptist Church. I was there for about five years. 
And uh, lately, uh, I'll just be honest with you, we haven't been uh, pastoring anywhere. We've been filling in here and there and, uh, and uh, have the opportunity uh, arises, we, uh, we go and fill in. Uh, next Sunday, I'll be in a, in a little church in Homeland, Georgia, the big town of Homeland, Georgia. So, uh, but as uh, Brother Stevie uh, called me Thursday uh, and said, y'all, I think already had a, had a speaker that was going to be here, and uh, we do need to pray for uh, his family. Uh, I believe what I understand is his mother-in-law may have passed away. So uh, let's be praying for them as they go through this time of, of grief there. And, uh, but let's get to the word this morning. That's the main important thing, amen, And uh, is the word of God. Uh, well, I can stand here and talk about me all day, and that's not going to get you anything but just to learn about me. The most important thing is why we've gathered here today is to seek God's will and seek God's word. Are you a compromising Christian? I don't know how y'all usually do it, but if you can this morning, let's stand in, in honor of God's word as we read Daniel chapter 3. And I'm going to start in verse 16. Now, we understand here King Nebuchadnezzar had made a decree that all people would bow down and worship their God. So let's start reading in verse chapter, first Daniel chapter 3, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king of Nebuchadnezzar, We are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he, he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if it not be unknown unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship thy golden images which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visions was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the fiery furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men. I want you to remember that right there. He commanded the most mighty men that were his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats and hosen and their hats and their other garments and were cast into the midst of the fire, burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because they, the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame flew. The fame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished. And he rose up in haste and spake and said unto the counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said, O king, truth, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt and no form. And the fourth is like the Son of God. Let us pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to be here. God, it's only you that can come into this place, change hearts, change minds, change our way of thinking, change our way of living. God, it's only you that can, can, can bring the Spirit, your Spirit, the Holy Spirit into a place such as this and change things. And God, that's what we ask of you this morning, is that your Holy Spirit set out on this place like it's never been set before. God, that people that came in this morning, they came in one way, but as we leave this place today, we can leave some other way. God, you tell us in your word that if we'll just seek your will, that if we'll just seek your guidance, that if we'll just seek your way of living, God, that you'll change us into a way that the world wouldn't even recognize us. But God, we live in a world 
that when we walk out of this place, sometimes we just look like the world. And God, we come to church and we, we have on our finest and we, 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 we proclaim to be a follower of yours. But God, help us that sometimes, including me, that when we leave a place of worship, we leave it right here. But God, my, my prayer this morning is that, that we don't leave it here today. That when we leave this place, we take it with us so that the world can see something different about us. God, I pray right now that I decrease and give you the increase. And everything that's said and done here today is to only bring honor and glory to your sweet and precious name. And God, all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Now in the Bible text this morning, we see that an idol raised up on a pedestal, 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. We see a band. We see a creed that left no room for doubt. And when the band plays, you bow or burn, is what the word says. You either bow to their idols or you burn into the fire. We also see that the band playing and most of the people bowing. But there were three men of God who refused to worship the idol. Now the question is this morning is, who are we? Are we the ones that when we hear the band play? Are we the ones when we hear the music charm? When we hear the things of the world, are we going to bow down to the world? Or are we going to be the three men of God that refuse to live like the world? You see, we live in a place today that church really doesn't mean anything anymore. I remember growing up, and I'm not that old, even though I don't have much hair and it's white. I'll only be 45 in, a, in another month. Amen? I'm not 65. I'm not 75. But I have seen some changes in just my life. And some of you that are here that's got a little less hair and a little bit grayer, you've probably been here a little longer than I have. And you've seen things that I haven't seen. But I remember growing up, even though I grew up in a home that was lost as a goose, I had a granny. She died when I was 15 years old, but I remember her. There was nothing that she would bow down to except her God. Now, I lived, like I said, I lived in a home that my parents were lost. They were they were just lost. They didn't know any better. And sometimes we look at lost people and we wonder why they're doing the things that they do. Well, if you remember right, probably some of you were lost at one time in your life too. Lost people live lost because they don't know any better. But Christian people who claim to be a follower of God should know better including me this morning. I thought about it this morning as I've been studying. I can't say I studied for this message all week because I just started studying Thursday. But I don't have to worry about that because I really don't even have to study at all if I just trust in God. He'll give me the words to speak. He'll give me the words to say and he'll give me what you need and I guarantee you he'll give me what I need. And I think I needed this more than anybody else because I got it in Sunday school. I've been studying it since Thursday. And now I got to preach it to myself. I'm going to get God's word one way or the other this week. Amen? You see, we, from time to time, we too are told to bow down to some false idols. Oh, not like the idols that maybe we see here in this one Bible. But they are idols nonetheless. There are many things in this world that become like gods. The question is, will we respond like these three Hebrew men? 
What do we see here? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that will help us. That's what I want to see this morning. And I'm not always a three-point three point Baptist preacher, okay? But this morning, I brought three points, okay? So we don't have to be here real long. I'm going to try to get y'all out of here as quick as I can. Y'all have a good little restaurant down here. I guess it's still open on Sundays, ain't it? Sweet teas and uh, some of you are probably uh, wanting me to hush so y'all can get down there in line and get that fried chicken first. Amen? What will help us? Point one this morning, we see an uncompromising dedication. We see an uncompromising dedication. Look what he says in verse 16 and 17. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, o o Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fire, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. You see, these three guys, they had made a decision a long time ago that they were not going to do anything but serve the one true God. You see, so many times in our life, if we're not living for God, if we're not studying God's word, and I'm preaching to me, I want you to understand that this morning, I'm preaching to me especially this morning because I've been there. I got saved when I was 27 years old. I got called into the ministry not long after that. Uh, I ran from it for about six months. I've lived for the Lord. I've preached God's word, but I've also been a backslidden Christian where I've got back out in the world and I don't no long, didn't no longer look like a church, a Christian, or anything of the church. I was, I was looking like the world. And let me tell you something, you're miserable. If you're a Christian this morning and you're not living for the Lord, there's only one thing you are, and that's miserable. You might think that you're happy. You might think that everything is going right. But when you get to a point in your life where you're about to lose everything, you're about to lose your job, you're about to lose your family, and you're about to lose everything, you come to your senses and you realize this is not happy. This is miserable. You see... We see here in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego an uncompromising dedication. Church, let me tell you something this morning. You can't wait till the test comes and then make a decision. You've got to make a decision long before the test ever comes. See, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had long before made the decision, when this time comes, what will I do? I will serve you, God, and only you. If I'm getting too loud, turn me down. Most people tell me I don't even need a mic most of the time. I get excited and I have compassion about God's word. What courage here we see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What boldness we see. What commitment we see. But these men didn't have to spend a lot of time thinking about it. You see, when you're, when you're in a situation where the test comes and there's nothing you can do, you're called up to the king and you either got to make a decision right then and right now or you're going to be pulled or put into a fiery furnace. You need to already have that decision made before you even get there. Somebody need to say amen right there. That's some good preaching even if, if I say so. They didn't go into a huddle I played football back in high school and we'd have to go into a huddle to figure out what play we was fixing to make to win. These guys here, they didn't go in a huddle. They didn't have to quickly decide a course of action. They had settled the issue long ago. Church, let me tell you something this morning. It's time for us to settle decision today. Because I can guarantee you there's a test going to come. There's a decision that's going to have to be made. You need to go ahead and log that thing in. Download it. And 
And I ain't up to date on all this young stuff. Go ahead and put it in your DM or whatever you call it. And make the decision today. I'm going to serve God. He's the one true God. He's the only one. See, they said, this is what they said. We will serve the Lord God alone, and him alone will we worship. Will we worship? Decide now that you won't cheat someone. Decide now. When the test comes, you won't have to be pressured in to make a decision. You know what one of the worst things I hate is for my wife or my kids. Y'all probably know what I'm talking about. They'll come to you at the last minute when they want to do something. And they say, we need a decision now, Daddy. We, we need a decision now, husband. She calls me honey then. <laughs> Y'all ever get that? She says, we need a decision now, honey. Why are you being so sweet now? Cause, and see, sometimes we'll be pressured into making a decision that normally if we had time to think it out, somebody hear me there? Normally if we'd have time to take, think it out, we would make the right decision instead of the wrong decision. Decide now. You won't commit adultery. And when temptation comes, you've already taken your stand. Decide now that you'll do the honorable thing. And when the opportunity to cheat or lie or whatever comes, you won't. But you know what happens so many times? We don't make the decision now so when the time comes, we make the wrong decision and before we know it, we're looking like the world instead of like the church. Decide today that you're going to serve God. And when you're tempted to shove him aside because I promise you there's going to be times in your life, let me tell you something, and, and I, I know it wasn't of God, God's not an author of confusion. God's not a, God's not a God that, that puts you in a situation so you'll turn away from him. God's not a God that wants you to be away from him. He's a God that loves you. He wants you right by his side, and he walks by your side, and he wants you to have a relationship with him constantly, day in and day out. He's not a God. So it was not of God. Some decisions that I've made in my life that I walked away from God from a short time and walked away from him and knowing what I was doing was wrong, but, but I didn't care. Because there was some time in my life that I should have made a decision that I wasn't going to allow myself to do this. And when the time came to allow myself to do it, I didn't know how to make the right decision. So I made the wrong decision. And when I made the wrong decision, I like lost everything. Decide to serve God now. You know, back, I don't even remember when it was, but somewhere around 2000, say I got saved in 2004. I want you to understand the whole time that I was backslidden, I was saved. You don't lose your salvation. But we can lose our fellowship and our walk with him. And sometimes that's to me, was worse than not having salvation. Because knowing you have something, but there's no relationship there, that's scary. Decide now to serve God. And when you are tempted to shove him aside, you will be faithful servant of the Lord. Well, these, these boys here, they had made their decision and stuck it out. They might have been tempted to make all kind of excuses. Well, we'll just pretend to worship the idols. 
How easy could that have been? How many times in our life do we know what's right in our heart? Listen to me. How many times in our life do we know what's right in our heart? But because the situation, because the surroundings we were, we were in, we feel like, well, in my heart, I know what's right. Between me and God, we got this. <laughs> God, you, you know what's in my heart. You, you know what's in my heart, God. I love you. I, I worship you. But right now, God, my buddies... My friends, my, my circumstances I'm in, I'm just going to pretend for a little while. Somebody right now knows what I'm talking about. Some, 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 somebody's been there. Maybe somebody's right here right now. I remember there was times in my life when I would be at work and I would hear a joke that maybe not, maybe wasn't so bad. But I knew it wasn't right. And instead of making a big scene, I made a decision. <laughs> you know how easy it is to make this decision? <laughs> it don't take much effort to walk away. You don't got to cause a big scene. You don't got to condemn them to hell for what they're doing. When you walk away from it, you take a stand. And you know what that stand is? That stand is saying, I love God. I don't want to be a part of anything that's not of God. And you know what one thing my wife told me? This is what she's told me. The one thing that hurts me most is that people, this is when you're in a backslidden stage now. Some of you have been there, some of you may not. I'm going to be honest with you. I couldn't understand for a long time how somebody could turn away from God. But it don't take but that long. <laughs> that long. One little thing can get you off track. Now, I don't know how true it is or whatever, but I remember when I was younger, we used to try it. It's probably one of the dangerous things we ever done. But I'd always heard that you could derail a train by putting a penny on the track. Now, I was young, dumb, and crazy. I don't know if that really happened. I never seen one over, in, and me and a buddy of mine, we was a railroad track, lived by, right behind his granny's house in Douglas. I don't know how many pennies we stacked on a railroad track. But I can guarantee you there's one little thing that can be as small as a penny that if we allow to get in our life will get us off track from God and it'll be just like that before you even know it. My wife would tell me, it hurts me to see people that are not living right are okay around you. That's hit home, church. That hits home. Because there used to be a time in my life when nobody wanted to be around me that was of the world. Because they knew what I lived for. Excuses. Excuses. We'll just pretend to worship this idol but we won't do it in our hearts. If we don't do it, people will laugh at us. We'll do it to save our skin. Better, better a live coward than a dead hero. After all, we have to respect other religions. 
And when in Babylon, this is their religion. You might ask this morning, why didn't they compromise? I believe there are a couple reasons right here why they didn't compromise. They realized there's only one God and this idol wasn't him. There's only one true God and there's only one God that we should serve and there's only one God that we will serve. Number two, they had a strong enough character to do right when wrong would have been easier and safer. Number three, they were God pleasers, not man pleasers. Let me tell you, this is one of the biggest things that a preacher has to deal with in his ministry. We have to continue to be God pleasers and not men pleasers. There's too many church congregations that their pastors are now being men pleasers instead of God pleasers. And that's why the shape of our churches are in the shape they are in. Because you have people of power and money and stuff that sit in the pews. And if you preach to God's word and it don't suit them, they get angry and they start telling you you're fixing to have to leave. Well, I got something for them. It don't matter if I leave. I own a business that I make a living at. I don't need their money. But I'm not going to stand and not preach God's word. They took a stand like the apostles did who said in Acts chapter 4, verse 19 and 20. Listen to what it says. Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than go. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. Number four, their eyes were on eternal, not just immediate things. I got to speed up. They wanted, number five, they wanted to have a clear conscience before man and God. So they had what? I believe what we've seen the first point, man, we've only only been through one point. I got to get through the other two real quick, right? We've seen the first point. We've seen an uncompromising dedication to God. The second point is I believe we see an unshaking dependency. An unshaking dependency. Look what verse 17 and 18 says there. It says in verse 17, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will serve thy gods, will not serve thy gods, nil, will not worship the golden image which thou hast set up. They believed in God's ability to save their lives. But even if he didn't, they would remain faithful to him. That's scary, ain't it? Could you imagine? In days, times, we probably wouldn't be thrown in a burning, fiery furnace, but we could be faced with this. And I believe one day I will, if if the Lord tarries, I believe we'll see more and more of this. I believe we'll be faced with a gun to our head and ask, are we going to serve God or are we going to serve the world? That's when it's going to get real. They believed in God's ability to save their lives, but even if he didn't, they would remain faithful to him. This was not, Lord, get us out of here and we'll serve you. How many times have we done that? (laughs) Most of the time we get ourselves in the situation that we're in And then we want to call on the Lord to say, God, if you'll help me get out of this. I remember back when I was lost and I used to drink. I don't know about any of y'all, if y'all have ever been an alcoholic, but I was an alcoholic. That's why I know I can't drink now because if I take a drink, I'll want it more and more and more. But, and you say, well, you're not that old. Let me tell you something. You can be an alcoholic at any age. But I remember back when I was drinking and Man, I didn't know a thing about the Lord, but I would call on him a lot of Saturday morning or Sunday mornings. Because Saturday night I'd had too much and I was feeling rough on Sunday morning. And I'd say, God, if you'll just get me through this, I'll never drink another drop. Well, you know what? 
I believe he got me through it because I'm still living today, but I didn't bow down to him. Next Friday and Saturday night, I was doing the same thing over and over again. How many times do we say, God, if you'll just get us out of this, we'll serve you. God, get me through this, and I, I promise you I'm going to be at church every Sunday, every time the doors are open, and man, uh, for about a week, you'll be on fire. No amens there. Probably some oh me's right there. Did you hear what I said? When he gets you out of that situation for a week, we'll be on fire, and then it's gone. It was, Lord, this is what they said, Lord, we will serve you whether you get us out of here or not. We believe you will do the right thing. They were confident enough that God is sovereign, wise, and good. They depended on God in their triumph or their tragedy. They'd keep an unshaking dependency upon him come that may. The bottom line was this, church. They be delivered out of Nebuchadnezzar's hands one way or the other. Whether God delivered them out of that fiery furnace and he lived and they, they was able, able to live physically in their body or if they was burnt up, either way, they would not have to bow down to a false idol. They were going to serve God. Oh, that right here is good, church. If they died, they spent, listen to this. Some of you ought to turn Pentecostal right here for a minute. I probably said the wrong words then. If they died, they would spend eternity with God. Do you realize this morning, church, that if you're a Christian, our main goal is to get to heaven and live with God eternally? Oh, what a glorious day that's going to be. Oh, the Word of God says that on that day, what day? On the day that the eastern sky splits. And God looks down and he says, son, go get my children. Woo! <laughs> that's going to be an awesome day. And that's what these guys were saying. It doesn't matter if we die or what. We will get to spend eternity with God. If they live, the king's wrath was ineffective, kill their body, and their souls were free. So what they have? They had an unshaking dependency. Third point, we're going to get ready to close. We see an undeniable deliverance. Look what it says in verse 24 and 25. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished. Now, I want you to understand two things right here. I believe the word of God said, let me see where it's at real quick, right? In verse 19, he says, when they refused to worship him, it says, then, then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fear and the form of his vision was changed. I want you to notice something right there. He was angry. His expression on his face showed it. But look what God's word said. When, when Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and he rose up in haste and spake and said to his counselors, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they said unto him, O king, true O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire. They have no hurt. They have, And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Can I share with somebody this morning that if we'll have an un, undeniable uh, compromising faith in God, that God will always be walking with us, talking with us, there with us every moment of every day, and that if we'll proclaim to be him, not only will we look like the form of 
of God because he said he created us in his image so that we would look like him, talk like him, be like him, walk like him, that God himself is walking with us constantly day in and day out. And it's the son of God that's in our lives. We see an undeniable deliverance. He took them through the fire. Took them through the fire. A little over 700 years, there was a man named John Huss. John was a Catholic priest in Russia. He criticized the corrupt practices of Catholic Church. John was arrested and tried and convicted and sentenced to death. He was kept in prison for seven months. Finally, the day of Huss to die arrived, July the 6th of 1415. Nearly 2,000 years after Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they placed a paper cap on his head and mocked the crown. It had a figure of devils upon it, inscription, this is heretic. No trembling of the lips, no, no trembling of the lips, no whitening of his cheeks. Huss was first tied around the middle of the ropes. A chain was passed over these. Chains were fastened to his leg and his neck, securely bound to a stake. The wood was piled with to his chin. Straw was placed beneath and beneath between the wood. Renounce your error, shouts the Duke. And Huss said this, in the truth of the gospel which I have written, taught, and preached, I die willingly and joyfully today. Then the fire was started and the red tongues of flame began to drive him by the wind rose high around his body and Huss began to sing this song. Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, have mercy on me. The flame circling above his head Yet the voice goes on, thou takest away the sins of the world. Have mercy on me. The flames wrapped around him and his head falls on his chest. The fire does it work and a heap of ashes is only that remains of John Huss. So what are you saying this morning, preacher? Jesus saved their physical lives, but God has not promised to always spare us physical harm and even death. Many Christians have been killed, but God has promised that even if someone destroys our bodies, our souls are safe with Christ. In closing this morning, Jesus saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fire. But as the story I just read, he let John Huss die in the fire. Why? I don't know why. And I'm not here to try to explain to you why or none, because I'm not God. God's God. He knows all things. He's in control. But do you think Huss was afraid to die? Sure he was. But Huss experienced an undeniable deliverance from fear, from persecution, from death, and to life. What a promise God gives to his own. Listen to what Isaiah 43, 2 says. It says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you. When life puts you into a furnace, it, keeps, it can't keep you there. When you're called upon to take a stand that brings you a suffering or death, remember the promise Jesus made. Take your stand for Jesus now. Let the chips fall where they may fall. But church, let me share with you this morning, take your stand for Jesus today. Let those who oppose you do so. Let come what may. Be uncompromising in your dedication. Be unshaken in your dependency into God. 
If you are, you will be be delivered in his time, in his way. This morning, I want to give you an invitation as the sister comes to play. And this is the invitation to surrender all you have and are, and are to him. Some may be for the first time. Maybe somebody's here this morning. You've never, you've never really surrendered your life truly to Christ. Well, can I share with you this morning, you'll never be fulfilled in full until you surrender your life to Christ. I, I, I've told this and preached this for years. I believe when we're born, there's a God-shaped hole in our heart. And there's only one shape that can fill that thing in, and that's God. And until we get that filled with God, we're lost. Are you lost today and you need Jesus? He's right here waiting on you. Some of us, maybe it's a renewal and a commitment. Hey, I feel in right here. I need renewal and, com- and, and recommitment every day in my life. Maybe some of you here this morning and maybe, I, maybe I'm overstepping, maybe I'm not. Maybe some of you have been visiting here. I know they don't have a pastor here now. But from what I've experienced, I felt the love of Christ from the first time I walked in this morning. And I believe that when, when, when you're a Christian, that you can, you can, you can feel that. I, I can share with you, I've been in some churches that I didn't feel Christ. And when I left out of there, I was wore out because I fought Satan all, the whole way through the sermon. I hope you've understood this word today, and I'm going to tell you it's been freely to preach it this morning. This is an invitation to surrender your will to his and to live from this day forth serving him as Lord. Who will make that surrender this morning? I can't beg you. Oh, I can, but I can't make you. All I can do is just share God's word with you. All I can tell you is that if if you're not serving God fully, let me share with you this morning, there's going to be a test that comes And if you're not careful, you'll fail. How do I know? Because I've been there. I've been right there. It's a constant battle every day. Even even when we're following Christ, it's a battle. Because all these things in this world look good. But they mean nothing if we're not living for the Lord as we stand this morning I don't know what you're going through maybe this morning you need Jesus and hey I'm I'm here for you I know you don't know me there's some other men women here that'll be glad to come down to this altar with you pray with you talk with you whatever that need is if you need Jesus come to him there's no better time than today The the word of God says today is the day of salvation Maybe this morning you've heard something in the Word and, and I'm, I'm, as soon as I hush up, I've got to go to the altar myself because I need recommitment. I need more dedication to the Lord. Maybe this morning there's something you heard and you've been battling with it for a little while, but this morning you say, I'm going to make this and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to commit this morning. I want to serve the Lord. Don't come down and commit and say, God, I'm going to do this. And no matter what, I mean, that's what we want to say. But just come down this morning and talk with Jesus and say, God, this is who I want to be, but I need your help to get me there. See, we can't do it on our own. We've got to call into a God that loves us and he'll get us through that fiery furnace. What does that need this morning? Will you come as we sing?
just as I am and wait.